Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you guys would like to take a seat, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, before we do, I'd like to go ahead and pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather with brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, as the family of God meets, may we hear your word and be nourished by it and transformed by it and conformed closer to the image of your son. Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, as Alex said, my name is Toby Palmer. I'm the director of student ministry and local missions here, and it is my pleasure uh, to share the word of God with you this morning. I am wholly inadequate to be a vessel, um, but we're all wholly inadequate, and God uses us anyway, so I'm thankful for the opportunity. Tonight, uh, today, we're going to be in James 3, 3 uh, 13 through 18, if you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. Um, and while you're turning, I want to tell you a little something about myself. Sometimes when I read the Word of God, it feels like I'm getting punched in the gut, like just a nice Tyson uppercut right to the liver. It just hurts. And it's because the Holy Spirit works through the Word of God to convict us of sin and move us to greater righteousness. And sometimes, actually all the time, but sometimes that happens more acutely than others. And this passage for me, and I think for you, will be one of those times because I have a tendency to want to do things on my own terms. Like, I like to think, for instance, that I can approach the Word of God and by my own wisdom and intellect understand it. I like to think that when I'm in interpersonal situations, I can rely on my own wisdom and intellect to navigate them. I like to think that I am capable of understanding how to act and what to do in a variety of situations, and I suspect you are too. Like, you think, whether you want to admit it or not, that you have what it takes to navigate life successfully, that you have what it takes to live in this world as God would have you live, not in the power of the Holy Spirit, but in your own power. And I think that this passage, perhaps more so than others in Scripture, kind of confronts us with the reality that that's just simply not true. Like, we are not wise enough. We don't have the wisdom that it takes to live this life as God would have us live it. So with that in mind, with our kind of inadequacy before us, let's approach the text. We're, again, we're in James 3, 13 through 18. Let's go ahead and read it together. Who among you is wise and understanding? By his good contact, conduct, he should show that his works are done in the gentleness that comes from wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-ambition in your heart, don't boast and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy, and good fruits, unwavering and without pretense. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who have cultivated peace. So right out the gate, James confronts us with this understanding that wisdom and conduct are integrally linked. Like there is a causal relationship between having wisdom and how we should live. Uh, so let's turn to verse 13. Uh, James opens this verse by saying, who among you is wise and understanding? And by doing that, he's actually al alluding to Hosea 14.9, which says, let whoever is wise and understanding understand these things, and whoever is insightful recognize them, for the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. And while that's kind of a summation of what Hosea is trying to say in, in whole, and I'm not going to go over all that Hosea has to say, at least what he's saying in that verse is, you have heard the word of the Lord, you have heard what he has called you to do, and if you are wise and understanding, you will walk in that. Like there is a causal relationship between true wisdom and the life that you live. And James is confronting the, us with that right out the gate. And he describes the kind of character that we should have as people who claim to be wise and understanding. Specifically, let the person who is wise and understanding display that through his good conduct. This good conduct refers probably to a godly life in general, although when we get to seven, 
17 and 18, James has some specific things to say about what godly wisdom leads to. But at the very least, it's those things, but it's probably godly conduct in, gen in general. And he qualifies that by saying that that godly conduct, that good conduct, comes from gentleness, from wisdom that comes from gentleness. Why gentleness? Why is James telling us that wisdom comes from gentleness? Well, I think it has to do with the fact that James understands true wisdom to come from God. Here's what I mean by that. When we, or he, 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 James is well aware of the book of Proverbs, and so when he's thinking about wisdom, he's probably thinking about verses like Proverbs 9.10, which says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And this idea of fear isn't necessarily terror, but it's an awareness that this being out here is so far beyond me and above me that I can't fully understand them and I absolutely cannot control them. And they have a vested interest in my conduct. Like this is a being who dreamt up the galaxies and then they existed. This is a being who speaks, and the world is formed by his voice. I can't contend with that, and yet he makes demands on my life. And that should produce a feeling in you that is something like fear. There's an awareness of your smallness and your inadequacy before God. And it is that awareness deep in your soul that produces wisdom. And that wisdom, this knowledge that God is so far above me, and he makes demands on my life, from, produces something like gentleness. The word can also be translated as meekness. If you'll remember, Jesus blesses those who are meek and says that they will inherit the earth. These people who are meek or gentle, these are people who've essentially exited the rat race. They've realized, look, I can't climb the ladder. I can't get the cheese. I'm not going to get there because God is so far above me. So I am content to rest in the place that he's put me in. I don't need to get even with other people because I know where my worth is and it's in the almighty God who created me. There's a gentleness that comes from that because now suddenly I'm not competing with anybody because I recognize my place. There is no getting to the top because God is at the top and he's above me. So why would I need to compete with you? So these relationships that are characterized by gentleness and meekness are non-competitive. And so genuine love and fellowship can flow out of them. Because I'm not trying to get over on you, and you're not trying to get over on me. See what I'm saying? Cool. <laughs> so with that kind of big overarching picture of wisdom in mind, James takes us in verse 14 through 16 to the complete opposite. Right? So let's read verses 14 through 16 again. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where there is envy and selfishness, there is disorder and every evil practice. The first half of verse 16 signals this contrast when it says, if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart. And just so you know, this idea of heart and Jewish and Greek thinking, it's not, it's not this idea that, like what I'm feeling. The heart is seen as the seat of all emotion, of all intellect, of your very being. Like your heart is who you are in Jewish and Greek thinking. So if in the deepest depths of your soul you harbor selfish ambition and, and, and uh, what is I'm sorry, selfish ambition and bitter envy, there are results for that. There, there are results that come from that. Let's talk about what bitter envy might mean. Bitter envy is this idea that I am defining my worth with respect to other people. And it's not that I just want to be as good as other people. I want to be better than them. I want to be higher than them. I want to step on them on my way up the ladder. Like my worth, I, my good is defined by your bad. Like I don't want to just have more, that's greed. I want to have more than you, that's envy. Can you see why that would conflict with gentleness and meekness? And selfish ambition is a very similar concept. It's this idea that I'm out for me. I'm in this for me. I want more for me. I want that higher position, not because I think I can do a good job, but because I want more pay. 
I want more prestige and influence, not because I want to better my fellow people, but because I want to have the final say. This ambitious desire that we have in our hearts to make ourselves God is destructive. This envious nature that is deep within us is antithetical to the gentleness that God's wisdom calls us to. And James says that if these things characterize your heart, do not boast and lie about the truth. In other words, don't boast about your envy. Don't boast about your selfish ambition. Don't try to disguise it for what it is. Because if you're doing that, you are narcissistically deceiving yourself and everyone around you. If this characterizes your life, it's not wisdom. In fact, in verse 15, he goes on to say, that wisdom is not from above. It's earthly. In James, he talks about earthly and heavenly a lot with the implication that earthly is is qualitatively inferior to what is heavenly. He, He talks about it as being unspiritual. Again, the contrast is between that which is spiritual and that which is not. Specifically, when James talks about spiritual and unspiritual, he's talking about the Christian life. There is a spiritual person who is led and directed and transformed continually into the image of the Son of God by the Holy Spirit. And then there is the unspiritual person who is living life apart from God and according to their own whims and ways. So to be unspiritual is to be fundamentally unchristian. And most strikingly of all, he calls this demonic. Like not only does it not come from God, not only is it characteristic of a non-Christian life, it has its origins in the devil. And it has no place among the people of God. In verse 16, James makes the communal effects of these attitudes of bitter envy and selfish ambition manifest. He says that these will always lead to disorder and to every evil practice. To disorder and to every evil practice. And should we be surprised? Does not scripture and experience testify to this fact? Like think back with me to our first parents, Adam and Eve. They're in the garden. They've been given everything they need and all they have to do is submit to the lordship of God. And yet selfishly, ambitiously, With envy, they take of the fruit because the deception, the deception there wasn't you'll live forever. That's the fruit of the tree of life. The deception is if you take this fruit, you will be like God. You will be able to know good and evil on your own. The deception is you won't have to be subservient to God anymore because you get to define things on your own terms. It's an envy that's born out of a jealousy for the position that God had in their lives. It is an ambition to usurp that authority. And what were the immediate effects? In Genesis 3, it tells us it resulted in alienation from God and alienation from one another. Like, relationships break down when these attitudes are present. It is destructive. It's corrosive. And doesn't our experience tell us the same? Have you ever been, have you ever been in a relationship with a narcissist? Have you ever been the narcissist in a relationship? Can you be in genuine relationship with someone who only wants what they can get from you? And can you genuinely love someone that you only want things from? Like if your whole agenda is to better yourself, to get what you can out of it, how can you call that love? How can you call that any kind of relationship worth having? Because what you've done is you've commodified another person. They are a means to an end, not an end in themselves. They are the next rung on the ladder that you have to step on to get you to where you want to go. How can you love them if that's how you see them? 
If bitterness and envy and selfish ambition characterize your life, friend, that is a lie from the devil that you have bought hook, line, and sinker. And it will destroy everything that you are trying to build for yourself. After all, is that not what sin does? Moving on to verses 17 and 18, James contrasts the wisdom that is from above with the wisdom that is from God. In verse 17, he talks about how this wisdom that is from above is first pure. The word that's used for pure here is also the word that's used for holy. It's this idea that it is without, oh, let me go ahead and read it for you, sorry. (laughs) But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So again, this idea that this wisdom is pure is also the idea that it's holy. It's this idea that it is unmarked and unblemished by sin. It's completely and totally blameless. And ultimately, holiness is first and foremost a characteristic of God himself. This purity and holiness characterizes God. And James spells out what that looks like for us. And James 3.13, he tells us that God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. In James 1.17, he tells us that there's no shadow of turning within God. In other words, he's always and totally consistent with himself. In James 1.5, he tells us that he's the giver of good gifts and that he gives generously and without reproach. In James 1.27, he tells us that God cares passionately about orphans and widows, and he wants us, he desires that we would remain unstained from the world. And that's just chapter one. But what we get from this brief picture that James paints for us is there is a God, and while he is totally other, he's utterly holy, he cares passionately about other people. He works for their good. And even working for his glory, some theologians will say that that is God do, God works for his own glory because he recognizes his glory is good for you. Like he wants your best and his glory is your best. So God is not envious. He doesn't have selfish ambition because who, who could he want to be over? He's already over everybody. And so God, because he recognizes who he is and he's satisfied in himself, is free to love and to give impartially and generously and without reproach. This is the God from whom godly wisdom comes from. And godly wisdom mirrors the very nature of God himself. James also tells us that it's first pure, that this wisdom is first pure. And what that means is every other attribute he spells out for us about this wisdom flows from the purity of who God is and who he's called us to be. Like this purity, this holiness is first and foremost among these characteristics and the rest flow from them. But he also tells us that it's peace loving. This describes an attitude that is opposite of the self riddled, disorderly and chaotic nature of the wisdom of the world. Like instead of strife, this this peace lovingness seeks unity, and it doesn't just seek the absence of conflict, it seeks genuine, godly shalom, which is a biblical concept of peace, which means that it's not just the absence of conflict, it's the presence of rest and contentment and flourishing for all people. In other words, to be someone who loves peace, you want those things for other people. You want them to be at rest, you want them to be content, you want them to have what they need, and you want them to flourish and prosper even if that means in spite of yourself. It's also gentle, as described above. This is someone who's able to, ge- to, to deal with someone in a non-competitive way. They're not out to one-up you. They're not out to usurp you. They're not out to get even with you because they rest fully in who God has made them to be. It's also compliant. This doesn't mean that someone who just, it doesn't mean someone who just goes along with everything. 
It doesn't mean that. It does mean that this is someone who is willing to listen to others and to submit on non-essentials for the benefit of peace. Like this is someone who wants, this is someone who's not concerned with being right. This is someone who's not concerned with winning an argument. This is someone who does not make mountains of molehills or fight for things that are frankly not worth fighting for. It is someone who will still, but we, but we do need to remember that this flows from purity. So there are stands that this person will make, but even in that, they're gentle in the way that they make them. They're also full of mercy and good fruit. Again, true wisdom, like false wisdom, produces effects in the world. And while the effects of false wisdom are disorder and chaos and the destruction of relationships in the very self, the result of godly wisdom are mercy. Mercy here doesn't just mean withholding judgment. Normally, when we think about mercy, we think about it in a judicial context. We're thinking the judge has mercy on this person, so he lightens their sentence or commutes it. That's not the biblical concept of mercy. The biblical concept of mercy is moving outside of yourself to give to an unworthy other. Sometimes that does mean offering forgiveness to the unforgivable, but it also means offering relationship to the unlovable, and it also means giving to those who cannot repay you. Because mercy is bigger than just withholding judgment. It includes, it's essentially just love for the other, unbounded and unhindered by self-interested desire. You're giving of yourself to someone who is unworthy of that gift. And it's born from this place of someone who recognizes their position before God and what God has done for them. Like God is merciful He withholds judgment, yes, but he also gives us the gift of his son, and he also gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit, and all of these things we are utterly incapable of repaying him for, and yet he gives them anyway. And the person who recognizes that necessarily will will perpetuate it. He also talks about good fruits. Certainly the fruits that he's talking about are the virtues listed in this list, but he's also talking about fruits up from elsewhere in Scripture. It's basically a catch-all term. So think with me about... The fruits of the Spirit in in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, what is it? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Did I miss one? I did? I did miss goodness? Oh, that's one of the good ones. Nah. (laughs) We're also talking about the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 3, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. There are other virtue lists in the New Testament. There are other aspects that define a Christian character. And James is probably catching all of these, like the wisdom that comes from God produces these in our lives. And then he also, lastly, he talks about how it's without pretense. What he means by that is that this is a goodness that flows from us without hidden agendas. Like it comes from us without any desire for self-aggrandizement. Like, these are people who are doing good for the sake of doing good. These are the people who are helping others without expecting someone to pay them back. This is someone who gives without expecting their name on a plaque. These are people who give, and they act in good and godly ways, but purely out of the desire to do good and godly things. As you can see from this list, the wisdom that comes from above is utterly different than the wisdom that's from below. One builds communities and is life-giving. The other destroys community and is life-taking. One seeks the good of the other. The other seeks the good of the self. One is all about winning the rat race, or climbing the ladder. The other is characterized by Jesus Christ who steps off the throne for the good of the other, who vacates his position to raise you up. One is of God, the other is demonic. 
James ends this passage in verse 18. He ends this passage in verse 18, and he says, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. And it is fitting that James would end here with peace. He talks about a wisdom that is characterized by gentleness, that is begun in purity and moves towards peace. And isn't that exactly what God does with us? Like, isn't God's dealings with us, doesn't it proceed from a place of holiness and purity, just like everything that God does? Is, aren't his dealings with us gentle and kind and loving? And does not God seek peace? Doesn't he seek shalom? Doesn't God create a world in which all of his creatures can flourish because they will reflect his glory in their flourishing? And by reflecting their glory, he's achieving their greatest good. And doesn't he desire the same thing for humanity? Doesn't he want all of us to be in right relationship with him through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? And doesn't he know that us being in relationship with him isn't just the absence of conflict with him, but it's actually our good. It's when we get to be most truly who he made us to be. That God pursues peace. He desires peace and all of his works move towards shalom, peace. And so shouldn't the wisdom that comes from God motivate us to do the same? Shouldn't we be seeking the good of all people? And shouldn't we be seeking their flourishing even if it costs us dearly? At this point, I want to ask the question, and I think it's a really important question. Where is wisdom found? Because James tells us wisdom is from above. And I want to share with you that that's actually good news. But before I can tell you the good news, I have to tell you the bad news. I look at this list, and it's a gut punch, because I know that those things do not characterize me most of the time. I know that I am selfish and prideful. I know that I desire a greater position than the one I currently occupy at times. I know that at a lot of the time, more often than I want to admit, I am out for my own good. And because of that, I am utterly incapable of living up to the kind of wisdom, the wise living that God calls me to. And if you are like me, you have had a similar realization during the course of this message. You are incapable of living up to this kind of wisdom. You are characterized by selfish ambition and bitter envy. And you have seen it wreak destruction in your relationships. And you can't fix it. You can't make it better. You can't get there on your own. And here's the good news. This wisdom is not found in you. It comes from above. And as we discussed, wisdom from above means wisdom from God. Here's the beautiful truth. God himself saw us in our lowliest state. And God himself, being the one who is pure and holy, wanted peace. And so he sent his son Jesus, the full embodiment of his wisdom, to live among us. And in all of his dealings with people, Jesus was characterized by gentleness and holiness and peace. And despite his peaceable nature, they crucify him. But this was part of the plan of God because God wanted to make peace with sinners. And to do that, he needed to sacrifice. And that sacrifice could have been us, but God in his love and in his mercy decided to take that on himself. And he died in our place and he was risen again so that we might have peace with God. And now, because of what Jesus did in the death and resurrection... You have an opportunity to have peace with God. And you have an opportunity to have his wisdom indwell you. Not because of who you are and what you've done, but because of who he is and what he's done. He has redeemed you. He has made peace with you by the blood of his son. 
And now he invites you as one who is a good father and who gives good gifts to his children to come to him and receive generously and without reproach. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God the Father who will give generously and without reproach. So if you are a believer, let me challenge you. If you're like me, you are not characterized by the wisdom of God all the time. So ask your heavenly Father to give to you his wisdom and to learn his ways. And let me promise you, he will be faithful to give it to you. And if you are not a believer, maybe you are living life and things are going great for you and maybe you think James is lying about this. To you, I would say, give it time. Sin always results in destruction. And if it hasn't happened yet, that is God's mercy in you, on you in your life. And I would implore you, come to him before it does destroy you. Or maybe you're here with us today and sin has already destroyed your life. Like you have climbed the ladder, you've joined in the rat race, you have used people around you and it's resulted in the breakdown of your relationships. To you, I would say, come. Come. God does not expect anything from you, and he gives generously and without reproach. And to you, he calls you to accept his son, Jesus. And in accepting him, he promises to become your father. And as your father, he promises to bring peace to your life. That doesn't mean a change in circumstances all the time. Sometimes we still have to live with the sinful consequences of our behavior. But it does mean contentment and rest in the midst of those circumstances. And it does mean the potential to flourish in spite of them. And so to you, I would also say, come to the Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. We thank you that you are holy and that you deal gently with us and that you move towards us in peace. And Lord, even though we are unworthy of the calling and incapable of fulfilling it, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for calling us to live with your wisdom anyway. And Lord, we thank you that you promised to give it to us if only we would ask. So Lord, I, I, I plead with you, inspire us to ask. Move our hearts within us to repent and to embrace you once again or possibly for the first time. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.